Guys, today's free training or a real estate training from real estate school is going to be five simple steps that you can use to get your first real estate deal. So we put together this training today just to break down five simple steps that you can use to get your first real estate deal. And that's what we're going to do. Let's go ahead and jump in. I'm going to share my screen with you all and we're going to rock and roll. All right. So as you guys know, Mike and I are the discount property investors. And the reason that we call ourselves the discount property investors is because we buy properties, scoot over a little bit, mm -hmm. at deep discounts. I don't think that I've bought a property at retail in over six years. The only one I bought at retail in that time frame was the one I live in. You really didn't even do retail on that. I didn't yeah. because it was off. It was, it was it was off market. Yeah. So and I got a deal on it, a little bit of a deal on it, but hundreds and hundreds of properties. Mike and I have probably bought a thousand properties in the last you know seven eight years, and ninety nine percent of them have been at deep discounts. So we call ourselves the discount property property investors for a reason. Money is made in real estate when you buy properties at deep discounts. Now, the purpose of this training, the five steps to getting your first deal, is really, to, to, I, the, the goal here is, is to fast track this process for you all, all right? We wanna fast track it, and ideally, you can get your first deal in 90 days. That's really the goal here, okay? So let's jump on in. Who are the discount property investors? Well, yours truly, David, real estate investing bootstrapper and ninja mentor helping struggling investors build real estate empires, and Mike, Go ahead. I am the total system building and marketing badass, the Navy SEAL of creating systems that put growing business on autopilot. So basically, I do a lot of the behind the scenes stuff, um, a lot of our marketing and just all the the day to day business stuff uh, that needs to get done to to succeed. Love it, man. Mm -hmm. Love it. Been investing in real estate, though. Shoot. 10 years it's been over a decade. We've almost been together a decade. Yeah, I think it's been about nine, nine. give yeah. or take. It's wild. It's wild, man. It's pretty awesome. Uh, but that's who we are. We're happy to uh, be here today. And you obviously know who we are, I would imagine, if you're in the community already. Okay, again, the training today, five steps to closing your first wholesale deal. That's what this is all about. Mike, tell us about step number one. Sure. So it's a market for motivated sellers. And this is what Dave alluded to earlier, but didn't really mention, is that he, he said, I haven't bought a, a listed property or a paid market out or market for a property in years. And it's because we buy direct from sellers and that's how you get a discount. You kind of eliminate um, the competition. You aren't bidding against a bunch of other people on the MLS. Uh, you're not working with agents who are uh, telling sellers, oh yeah, you can get this much for your property. So you're going direct to seller. So marketing for motivated sellers. We do that in a few different ways. Uh, the primary one that we're moving back towards is direct mail. Uh, we I really are, like that too. are pushing that. We do some pay-per-click advertising. Uh, we, cold calling. Do, we do some cold calling. Uh, we used to do the cold texting. We don't really do that. Uh, we also generate our own list through driving for dollars. Um, and those are usually our best performing lists the ones that you make yourself. So again, that is kind of the marketing side of it. Dave, you want to add anything on marketing? You know, this is a marketing business. Mm -hmm. I would definitely like to mention that. This is a marketing business before it's any other business, folks. So keep that in mind, all right? If you are not doing some sort of marketing, you don't really have a business. Also, what is the definition of marketing? Well, our definition is simple. It's getting people on the phone. That's it. That's all marketing is. It's doing some sort of activity, either time consuming activity or um, capital consuming. It's, it's, it's time or money, right? That's the activity that you're going to use to get people on the phone. All right. Very it's funny. Somebody actually just asked me yesterday, uh, hey, Mike, you got an MBA. That's really impressive. And I was like, ah, it's really not that one. He said, what's the what's the one thing? You got an MBA. Yeah. I didn't know that. That you took away from your MBA school. And I said, well, or what are the five best things? And I said, the only thing that I really took away was that saying is that no matter what business you are in, you're in the business of marketing. This is from an entrepreneurship class, but I'd say that is the one thing that burned into my brain. I've shared it with Dave. It's burned into his brain. Like it is how we live. 
is through marketing or businesses. That's how businesses live through marketing for motivated sellers in our business. Love it. Step two, make a ton of offers so you can get properties under contract. So here's the thing about doing deals. You don't even have to buy properties, folks, to be able to do deals, but you need to contract them. You need to understand and learn that you need to get control. That's really what we're getting at here is offers give you control. Control gives you the ability to have inventory. All right. Imagine that you walk into a Target or a Walmart or a Costco and there's nothing on the shelves. What are you going to do in there? You're going to leave. You're going to walk away. There's nothing to do there, right? They have to have stuff on the shelves for you to buy. Well, in our business, we don't even need a brick and mortar store. We don't even need shelves. But hypothetically speaking, whenever we make offers and we put properties under contract, we are creating inventory. And that inventory goes on that hypothetical shelf that our customers can then come and browse and shop from. You make money by selling things to people, period, right? So we need to understand that we need to make a lot of offers or a ton of offers so we can get properties under contract. Go ahead. Why do you have to make a ton of offers, Dave? That was the question I was just getting ready to ask you. Perfect. How many offers do we have to typically make to get a deal? It varies depending on the lead source. I would say a good lead source, we're probably going to make 20 offers. And, you know, a not so good lead source, we might have to make 100 offers. Right. So, you know, find a good average in the middle. Now, also, there's going to be another variable here um, with more skill, which basically comes from experience trial and error, learning, time, all the above, the amount of offers that you're going to need to make to get a deal is going to get drastically smaller. So Mike and I, we're probably averaging 15 to 20 offers, give or take, to get a deal. So if we can go out and we can make 30 offers in a week, guys, what does that mean? That means we're going to get two deals in a week. So it's our goal every day to go out and make a ton of offers. We've already made one this morning at breakfast mm -hmm. that we're going to hopefully win, which is sweet. Um, but you know, when I first started, I would probably make 30 to 40 offers before I was able to get myself, well, maybe even 50 in some cases. So 90 is probably an exaggeration. So there's a couple things I want to comment on. So why, or why do you have to make that many offers? Well, it's because what we talked about at the beginning, we're making offers lower than what people want to hear. So we're discount property investors. We're buying properties at a discount. Typically these are distressed properties, but we're buying them at a discount. So we have to make a ton of offers before someone raises their hand and says, yes, I am motivated enough to sell to you at that offer that you made me. That makes sense for me. So again, you're creating a win-win, even though it is what would be considered a great deal on it. So that's why we have to make a ton. Why does our number of offers go down, as Dave mentioned? Well, you start to know when these sellers are motivated or not. True. So you're not making the offers on these ones where they're asking retail. You may not even be running the appointments at that time or whatever it is. So that's why your number of offers will go down, but you're still making um, those lower offers. You also dial in your offers. You know what to make. So Speaking of that, mm -hmm. step three, evaluate the deal. And that's mm -hmm. really what we're going to do in order to make the offer, right? But we sometimes will make, I shouldn't even say sometimes, most of the time, we're going to make an offer to kind of see if they're motivated or not. And then if they're in the same ballpark as at us, then that's the time that we're going to really start evaluating the deal. And that's essentially why this is step number three and not step number two. I feel a lot of new investors, they want to confuse this. Mike, go ahead. I, yeah, I, no, that's exactly I'm, what I'm I was getting. I was ready, to, your mind, I was ready to say it. <laughs> Why do we put step two before step three? Why aren't you evaluating your deal first? Well, it's not a deal if it's not under contract, mm -hmm. first of all. Love that. And second, is uh, as a new investor, we would spend way too much time what ifing and thinking about properties before you put it under contract. It, it, again, like Dave said, we have to have inventory. Make the offer. And then evaluate it. This is just like any other real estate transaction where a buyer says, hey, I'd love to buy this at $100,000. Uh, but then they get an inspection. They say, well, I don't really want it at $100,000. Now I need you to put a new roof on and do this and that and blah, blah, blah. So that's why evaluate is after. And I think that's worth pointing out. Um, you are doing a quick eval, obviously, before you make your offer. But then you're actually going to dive into the deal uh, when, you're, when you're sealing the ink and getting it under contract and all that as well as it just leads right into that next step too. Um, Absolutely. When you're evaluating it, that's how you're going to be able to market it too because you're going to run the scenarios now. Oh, well, what if I flipped it? How much would a flipper, you know, what would they yep. want to pay? And we're going to break what down all I... these steps in detail. They all have their own slides. Yeah, yeah. 
I love it. Oh man, we're going too. We're going. We're going. We're too, going too. We're deep. going too slow. Going we got to speed it up. Mark step number four. Right. Market your deal and find a cash buyer. Again, we're gonna break all that down in detail here later on. Step number five: locate title company or closing attorney and coordinate the closing. Guys, this is it. This is the steps that we take to do deals. Mike and I have done over seven hundred wholesale deals. We can literally do these in our sleep. Here's the thing: we're not special. You guys can do this too. These are the same steps that we'd use. We've closed deals in probably, I'm guessing, 10, 15 states. Do it all over. Most of the time, it's going to be in Missouri and Illinois where, where we where we live and operate. But we've done wholesale deals with students all over the place, partnering with them. We love to do it. We can partner with you too, okay? Five steps. Keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate it. Moving on. Step number one. Let's break this down into more detail here. Step number one, market for motivated sellers. You've already mentioned this. This is a marketing business before it's any other business. So section A, eliminate the scarcity mindset, folks. This is truly the most important thing. There are plenty of deals out there, literally. Think about this. At any given time, somewhere between 3 and 5% of the population is in distress. Now, these aren't things that you or I or Mike or any of us are going to be wishing on other people, but we can't control these things. I can't control people getting sick or dying or losing their job or getting in a fight with their spouse and getting divorced um, or, you know, not paying their taxes. These just things are, these are a part of life. All right. So at any given time, between three and 5% of the population is dealing with this. Uh, there are 2.2 million people in St. Louis where we live. Mm -hmm. Alexa, what Roughly. is 4% of 2 million? 4% of 2 million is 80,000. So there's 80,000 people in St. Louis where we live and operate, and there's tons of cities all over the place. Just in ours, there's 80,000 people that are in that are dealing with some sort of a distressed situation. The point here is that there are plenty of deals out there for everyone. Mike and I cannot work every single deal in St. Louis. In fact, there are probably two or 300 other investors Easily that are doing marketing. That are and, doing marketing. Now, I'm not yeah. even saying that are just buying and selling and flipping. That are doing marketing in our town. And we're still able to go out and do two or three deals in a month pretty easily. Sometimes five or six or seven. But the, the main thing is, is you can't have the, the, the scarcity mindset. Deals are everywhere. It's your job to find these motivated people, get in front of them, market to them, and make friends with them ultimately. Just to make friends. B. They are easy to find if you are marketing for them. Guys, nobody is going to know about you if you are sitting in a room all day by yourself watching Netflix. Nobody knows who you are. They don't know what business you're in. They don't know that you can solve problems for them either. So it's your job to get out in front of these people. Take it up, Mike. My, my C. All right, so we're going to start our marketing business as soon as possible, and this is where we were getting excited before uh, talking about the other ways that we can and the ways that we do market. Um, so there's free ways, there's inexpensive ways, and there's expensive ways to uh, find leads. Whoop. Typically, the more money you spend, no, jump we'll, ahead, jump ahead. typically the more money you spend, the higher quality lead you're going to get. So um, the free lead. So if you say, hey, on Facebook, you mentioned I buy houses, which is still a great way to do it. It honestly, and some of those free leads are even better. They you're are. Ne you're networking. Uh, you can get really good leads. Uh, but you're not going to have as much reach as if you send 20,000 postcards to uh, different people in your city who have met some criteria as a property owner, et cetera, et cetera. So again, there's just, there's different tiers of it. It doesn't really matter which marketing method you choose. It's the one that you're going to stick to, the one that you're going to keep doing that is going to work for you. Um, but again, it, it's just picking one, getting into it, figuring it out and making it work. Um I mean, I don't know. I think a good example of a discussion that we have frequently would be, well, what does this marketing message say compared to this one? Like, is it better if I use um, a postcard or is it better if I use a letter? It doesn't matter. Uh, the, the thing is, just send it. Like, you just have to send them. Yeah. Like, you're not going to... What's better, a postcard, a billboard, or a bandit sign? Well, they're all going to get the same message across. It's just, are you going to get more views on a billboard than a bandit sign? Well, obviously you are. You're going to also pay more for a billboard than a bandit sign. But to Mike's point, marketing works. All of it. There is no such thing as bad marketing. It's just, are you doing enough of it? Love that. Yeah. Keep it simple. So again, free, inexpensive, more expensive, and then more costly. 
direct mail, pay-per-click advertising is probably going to be, you know, more costly. The most costly is going to be television, radio, billboards, bus stops, buses, right? But the more you spend on your marketing, the bigger the reach, aka also known as the more people that you are going to get in front of. If you don't have the resources to do billboards or radio or television, no problem. Mike and I don't really dabble in that either, but we do send mail and we do have a website that we send leads to. And we do post in local classifieds like Craigslist and Facebook. And we do put out bandit signs from time to time. And we do mention on Facebook, AKA networking with our sphere that we are investors and that we're looking to buy houses. So if you're new to this and you haven't done anything yet, the very first thing you should and could be doing could and should be, I should say, <laughs> is go to Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and just make a post that literally says, hey, I'm looking to buy some properties. If anybody knows anybody that's in a, in, a, in a situation where they need to sell, I would love to talk to that person and essentially try to help them solve some problems. So keep it simple. All right, moving on to step number two, guys. Make a ton of offers and get properties under contract. This is literally the second step. The first step is being known. It's the marketing part of it. Nobody knows who you are. Nobody's going to call you. If you can get people to call you, great. And if you can't, then you need to be calling them. All right, that's marketing. Moving on, step number two. We got to make a ton of offers and we got to get properties under contract if we want to gain control, like we talked about earlier. All right, Mike, go ahead and hit up A. All right, so offer on every single call or lead you get no matter what boom all right so why is that we are spending money or time or effort which again is basically money we are spending resources to get people to call us we talked about marketing is basically making that phone ring so every time you get the opportunity to talk to someone who is selling a house or has expressed interest in selling a house You've got to make that offer. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. Yeah. Why throw um, money in a fireplace, guys? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it burns, but so does wood. And wood's a whole lot cheaper than $100 bills. So don't do that. Use the $100 bills to buy wood and burn the wood. Same thing. We're using $100 bills to buy marketing. So people call us. We're not necessarily you know, doing it any other way. It's very simple and straightforward. When they call us and they say, hey, I see that you guys are home buyers. You're interested in buying a home. Then we say, yes, absolutely. We would love to buy your home from you. You know, tell me more about the property so I can make you an offer. That's it. Don't overcomplicate it. B, if you don't make an offer, you will never get a property under contract. It doesn't get much more clear than this. We, I, I talk to people all the time. Dave, I've been in real estate for four months. Dave, I've been in real estate for six months. Dave, I've been a real estate investor for a year now. And I say, great, that's amazing. How many offers have you made this week or this month? And they often say, oh, well, I'm just, I'm taking courses and I'm learning and I'm listening to podcasts. And then I say, cool, you didn't answer my question. How many offers did you make this month? And the answer is often none, not yet. I'm not, I'm not there yet. And I then correct them. And I say, okay, I get it, but let me correct you because you're not a real estate investor. And they say, well, what do you mean? And I say, well, you become a real estate investor when you start doing the activities that real estate investors do. And then the light bulb goes off, right? And then I say, and that main activity is making offers. So if you want to be a real estate investor, I'm not saying don't go listen to podcasts and don't take those courses, but you need to start doing those activities, folks. You need to start making offers. So if you don't make offers, literally, you're never going to get a property under contract. Doesn't get much more straightforward than that. Take it away with C. Uh, what do we got here? There are plenty of leads out there on Zillow or Craigslist or... For sale by owners, for rentals, for practice, it looks like. Okay, so this is basically saying... Facebook, too. Fa Facebook as well. So this is one of those things... Yeah, you're right. Facebook Marketplace, man. We need to throw They've, got, they've kind of taken over Craigslist, really. Dude, they really killed it, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so Zillow's got for sale by owners. We're, uh, we're digressing. The point is, if you're like, I don't know what to say. I'm nervous. I don't want to start marketing. I Whatever. Well, go out there and find some of these free leads. So again, these are practice leads. They're the for sale by owners or a rental lead and call them up and just start practice talking to people about real estate. I mean, that that's, um, yeah. I mean, again, you can make the offer every day. You Absolutely. can literally find a house every single day that someone's got for rent. If you're, hey, you're a landlord. Uh, I noticed you're trying to rent out this house. Would you consider selling it? That's it. And Mike, to your point, I love your point. If you're, if you're um, nervous 
about going out and spending a few hundred or even a few thousand dollars on marketing because you don't know how to talk to people or set an appointment, go find free leads, Craigslist, Zillow, Facebook Marketplace. They can be for sale by owners or they can be for rents. If they're for sale by owner, call them and schedule an appointment and go walk the property. You're going to learn something. Make them a low offer. Offer them 50% of what they're asking. You're going to learn something. If it's a for rent, just make the same call. But instead of basically, instead of saying, I want to offer you money to buy it, just ask them first. Hey, I see you have this for rent. Would you also consider selling it? And if they say no, then say thank you for your time and move on. If they say, yeah, I actually would love to sell it, but I don't think I can. That's why I'm renting it. Great. Let me get out there and let me view the property and meet you and talk with you and make you an offer. Those aren't going to cost you a dollar. They're just going to cost you time. It's a great place to start Whoop, and learn. I'm jumping ahead here. Where am I at? Two? Yeah, that was right it. here. Yep. Um, it's a great place to, to be able to get in the game and to learn. All right, D, if you don't know what to offer, then ask what the least they would take for it is and or offer somewhere between 50 and 75% of that number or 50% of the Zillow Zestimate. The idea here is, is that we're not going to essentially buy the property at half of what Zillow says it's worth. We're oftentimes going to be willing to pay 60, 70, 75% of that number even, but we don't pay retail. All right. If Zillow says the property is worth 200 grand and it needs $30,000 worth of work and you buy it for 200 grand, you are going to lose money. Okay. So we go in at 100,000, knowing that we might be able, willing to pay 120 or 130 in this case to see if they're in the same ballpark as us, all right? If they're at 200 and it needs work, and that's what Zill says it's worth, they are not motivated. Move on. If you offer them 100 and they say that they owe 110 and they'd sell it for 120 and it only needs 30 grand worth of work, that's a deal we would do right yeah, there. Yeah, then, then you're in the right ballpark. Now you're in the ballpark. So not knowing what to offer is not an excuse, folks. Literally, whenever we get new students that come in, they say, I don't know what to offer. Not acceptable. Offer 50% of what Zillow says it's worth to just make the initial first offer and then pause and wait and see how they like it. And if they hang up on you, good. They're doing you a favor. You're not wasting any more time. And if they say, you know what? Thanks for making that offer. It's too low. I need to be a little higher. If it's only a little higher, you're in the ballpark. If it's a lot higher, you're not in the ballpark, but it's still a lead opportunity that you can follow up with later. Period. Don't overthink it. Beautiful. What's the next thing you've mentioned? Follow up. Follow up. I did. Follow yeah. up. Keep following up and then follow up some more, guys. That's it. Mike, the average deal we do takes about forever. <laughs> <laughs> Four well, months. It... Give or take. Mm -hmm. The average. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't do a deal in 90 days. That's the whole point of this presentation. You can. You know, I would say maybe a third of the deals that we get in the door, we get them, we get them under contract within 30 days. All right. The other two thirds take time. They take two or three or four months. Sometimes they take six months or a year or two years. That's okay if you're not going away. We obviously are not going away. So follow up. There will be deals that come in right away. There will be deals that come in or leads that come in that aren't deals. And that's where you need to follow up. So be very, very persistent with your follow-up efforts. Man, this mouse is very, very tricky today. Okay, I'm not gonna touch it. Follow-up is key. This is the next slide, folks. Our average deal, four to six months, give or take. We just mentioned that. So here's some statistics that I want to go over with you. 48% of salespeople will never follow up with the prospect. That's good news for you. Why is that good news for you? Because half your competition isn't going to follow up. And you are. So literally, if you follow up and you make one follow-up call, you're going to be doing better than 50% of your competition. 25% of people are going to make a second contact and then stop. 12% are going to make three contacts and stop. Only 10% of salespeople are going to make more than three contacts. So if you follow up more than three times, you are going to be in the top 90% of the prospects going after that motivated seller. I would say, I don't know the exact statistic, but Mike and I's average deal that's four months long or longer probably has somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 follow-ups. Yeah, there's a lot. Some of them have 50 or 60 that are a year or two years in our system and we're calling them every two or three weeks, guys. Do the math, right? It could be 40 or 50 follow-ups. But that's okay because those follow-ups take two or three minutes. When we do the deal, we make 30 or 40 grand. It's a no-brainer. You look at the amount of time or the amount of money we make per hour, it's in the thousands of dollars. 
It's a no-brainer. All right, moving on. 2% of salespeople, 2% of sales, not people, but sales themselves are going to be made in the first contact. What does that tell you? It tells you that you're going to need to make a lot of calls and talk to a lot of people. So if you do some marketing and you get three calls and you make three offers and you don't get a deal, it doesn't mean you suck at this business. It just means that you haven't spoke to enough people. You're not getting the motivated sellers that you're seeking on the phone. There's a difference between people that want to sell and people that need to sell. All right. I'm not saying that I don't want to talk to those people that want to sell because at some point they're going to become those who need to sell. But really the goal here with all of this marketing is to get in front of those people that need to sell. So need to sell people, make an offer, go run an appointment, make a friend. Want to sell people, be friendly, make an offer, and then follow up until they want or need, I should say, until they become one of those need to sell people. 3% of sales are going to be made in the third contact, 5% on the, on the, or 3% on the second, 5% on the third, 10% on the fourth, 80% of all of your sales are going to be made on the fifth to 12th contact. And I would even go just more, more general five plus contacts. We do them all the time where there's 30 or 40 contacts. So you have to understand follow-up is a huge piece of this business folks. Okay. Step number three, we're moving along evaluate the deal. And again, we talked about this up on this slide right here. We're going to do making the offer first before we evaluate the deal. The reason that we do that is because evaluating the deal can be time consuming. And this is a big mistake that we see every single day with people in our mentorship program is they spend an hour evaluating a deal just to make a call and say, yeah, I'm going to offer 50% of the Zestimate. And then they get hung up on why waste an hour? Don't do that. Make the offer first, see if they're in the ballpark, then go to the evaluation step. It's step three for a reason, not step two. Mike, tell us all about A. All right, so we're gonna start with the ARV or finding comparable properties in an area that have sold recently. Uh, so basically we're uh, gonna start determining uh, what other properties should sell for and digging a little deeper than just that Zillow's estimate, like Dave said, it's kind of your diving off point. Uh, this estimate is not 100% accurate. Uh, then you're going to determine your repair costs and determine your ARV. ARV, I didn't, I don't even think I said that, was your after repair value. Um, so that's really what we're trying to determine is what is our, the most this property could sell for. What is the after repair value? And we do that. Um, with this formula right here, simple. That's how we get our offer, correct? Mm -hmm. But an ARV is just a little, oh, the ARV. A little gotcha. piece of yep, that yep. formula. It's comps. So our, it's kind of, yeah, you got to run comps. Um, so the MAO is what the formula is called, and that's maximum allowable offer. And the maximum allowable offer is going to be that ARV, so the after repair value of the property, kind of the, the best case, times a discount rate. Now we use 0.7 here. Uh, but we, again, you adjust it in different markets and different areas, but 0.7 is great uh, starting point, great jumping off point to use. We then subtract the repairs. So again, they said, oh, this thing needs a 20,000. Well, then we're going to subtract that. And then you subtract a wholesale fee if you're going to wholesale this property. So you're going to subtract another couple thousand dollars. And we're going to get a number. So let's just throw out an example. and We'll try to use some round numbers here of that uh, $200,000 property. Uh, we're going to multiply that by 0. 0.7. So we're at 140,000, needs 30,000 in repairs, and we want to make a $10,000 fee. We're right at that $100,000. That's 50% of that ARV. And that was where we were kind of starting our uh, quick off the envelope offer, 50% uh, of this estimate. Uh, your MAO it is, a, is amazing. Um, it comes very close to that very often. Uh, so that's why we use that as a jumping off point. Now, not every time, and sometimes they're wildly different. Yeah, it could be way uh, low, could be way high. But, but that's where we that's why we jump off from uh, that because it's easy, it's quick, it allows people to not be afraid to jump on the phone and and say a number that seems really low. Here's the cool part, guys. Justified. You don't even need a calculator. You don't even need a pen and paper. You don't need a crazy a crazy sheet. So watch this. With the help of Alexa here, I'm going to give Mike an ARV and a repair estimate, and he's going to tell me the most he can pay. 237K ARV with 32,000 in repairs. 
Alexa, what's 70% of 237,000? 70% of 237,000 is 165,900. So 166, round it up. Alexa, what's 166 minus 32? 166 minus 32 is 134. So 134, 134. is the most Mike can pay. Mike, what are you going to offer? Well, I am going to do a whole, I'm going to take a wholesale fee. So I'm going to take off 10 grand in this case. Uh, 122 is now 124. 24. 124. Uh, and then I'm going to take off a little bit extra because I never want to start at that um, at that price, at the maximum allow off because that's the most I can pay. So I'm probably going to offer 110, 115. Boom. Just like that. Just see what that's think. how offers are made. That's how we do it right here. Okay. Do not start with your MAO just like Mike did at the last step. Start below that as this is the most that you should be willing to pay. Keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate it. Evaluating the deal is all about running comps, using a formula, and then making the actual offer. You may make a soft offer, see if you're in the ballpark, but once you get out in the field and you meet them and you determine what your actual repairs are going to be, then you can use this formula right here, and then you can actually make them a hard offer or an offer that is going to be much more firm and one that you can actually move forward with. But we're not wasting time using this formula or doing any of this stuff in the beginning because if they don't like the ballpark that we're in, why waste time evaluating the deal? So one caveat to that. Though, Let's go back. Yep. So that you you make a really low offer and you think, man, this just can't be right. Um, you know, they said, no, nah, it's too low. Tell them, hey, you know, maybe I'm wrong. I'll call you back if I think I can do better. Totally. So you keep the door open uh that way as well or another way to keep that door open love that is what's another thing you'll you'll drop in there dave you'll say hey uh if something changes uh call me or or yeah. you say hey can i follow up with you in a few weeks maybe something will change yeah. you know something like that you just want to keep those doors open or if too. you get an offer where you're at you know I, I want you to get the most for the property so if you get an offer higher than where we're at please by all means go work with that person or take that offer but in the meantime, I'm going to work on my numbers and see if I can't get a little bit better number. But at the end of the day, I'm not going to go above and beyond. I'm going to make the offer. I'm going to see if they're in the ballpark. And then from there, either they're going to move forward with an appointment or I'm going to follow up. That's it. Keep it simple. All right. Step four, market your deal and find cash buyers. We can fly through this one. This is actually the we, easiest. And we do need to speed up a little. We, we got do. another call after this. Yeah, yeah. This, this is the easiest part, folks. Step four. All right. We're going to post our deal. Now, when I say deal, what I mean is, is property under contract. Mm. It's the inventory that I talked about in the beginning of this training. We need to have inventory on our shelves to be able to sell things. Well, the deal is the contract. It's not a property that we've purchased. It's a property that we have under contract. Make sure that we're very, very clear on that. So we're going to post that property and that contract for sale and that information in Facebook Marketplace, as well as local Facebook groups. We're going to post it on Craigslist, Zillow, eBay Classifieds, wherever else you can, right? Maybe meetup.com, right? Actually, I'm going to change this here to meetup.com because eBay Classifieds is kind of kind of, kind of yeah. dead, right? Craigslist, Zillow, meetup.com, uh, et cetera. Facebook Marketplace and local Facebook groups is really going to be the best place to start but these other ones can be very helpful too. You're also going to network at your local RIA clubs, real estate investment associations. Again, you can find those over on meetup.com um, and go to your, your local meetup groups. Bring your deals with you to these groups. Bring a printout of these deals and give them to people at the group that are interested in the deal. Call, text, email investors that you know and see if they are interested. You can build your own buyers list or you can go pull lists online from our favorite resource, batch leads um, of local cash buyers and local transactions that are cash transactions and then start marketing to those investors as well. And then last but not least, you can start a, start an Excel sheet. Well, I already mentioned this actually, and actually start to build a buyer's list. People that you have made friends with that you've met at RIA's or that you've spoke to on the phone about particular deals. And you can add them to your CRM and you can essentially bulk text and bulk email these individuals to help get exposure on your deals. This is literally the simplest step of the process. All right, step number five, my favorite step actually, this is where you actually get paid. Once you get through the first five steps, market to market your deal or market yourself as a problem solver to motivated sellers that are dealing with problems. 
Then go out and make a ton of offers, run appointments, make friends. Then evaluate those deals and give them a, a more refined, firmer offer. Get it under contract, okay? Market your deal to find cash buyers. Last but not least, you are going to your local title company or closing attorney, and you're gonna coordinate the closing. Now, here's the great part. Mike and I don't need to be experts at title at all. That's what we utilize title companies and closing attorneys for. You can literally Google title companies in your area. So for us, we would type in title companies in St. Louis, Missouri. You're going to call them. You're going to ask them if they know what a double close is and if they work with investors. You could also ask them if they know what a double close or assignment is and if they work with investors. Keep it simple. Ask them if they do a lot of assignment deals. Oh, it's already there as well. Get their email and phone number along with a contact person and start building a relationship with them. I cannot stress this enough. If you make friends with people, they are going to answer your calls. They're going to want to work with you. If you are a stranger, they're going to kind of, you know, want you to prove themselves to them, prove yourself to them. So make a friend, right? Mike and I, during every holiday, we send gift cards to our title reps. We take them out to lunch. We bring them lunch. We bring them coffee sometimes at closing just as a gesture. We're making friends and building relationships with these people. Last but not least, you're going to send your A to B contract. This is your contract with the seller. And then your B to C contract, also known as an assignment agreement, over to your title rep, along with any earnest money, which is typically $100 or less. Oftentimes, it's only $10. And then you're going to help them coordinate the closing. But they are going to essentially coordinate all of the paperwork and all of the little T's and I's being dotted and crossed. All you're going to do is coordinate with them that they have everything they need. If they need some paperwork, get them the paperwork. But don't think you need to go understand what titles and deeds and mortgages are, guys. That's for them to figure out. Your job is to find a motivated seller, get a contract on it so you have inventory, market the contract, find a buyer, mark it up, make a spread, boom, you get paid. We've done that 700 plus times. If we can do it that many times, you can do it once or twice in 90 days, guaranteed. The good news is the discount property investor uh, business, Mike and I, we want to train you and we want to partner with you on deals. Keep it simple. Mike, tell us some of the reasons why people fail in this business. I already mentioned tons of these already, but um, I mean, I think the biggest one is just people quit or they, they quit before they even get started. Absolutely. Uh, we've got a list here though, right? So uh, they can't get their first deal done. So they quit uh, not knowing where to start analysis paralysis. That's super common. Um, and that was one of them I think we were kind of alluding to about people not making offers. Oh, I don't know what to offer. They start analyzing a deal too much before they've even gotten on the phone with the person. Totally. Um, so yeah, there's there's tons of reasons why people fail. I I think that the, um, I don't know, maybe the biggest one though is, I mean, just, I think that probably is the biggest one is the, is the insecurity. They, they it, fear it their lack of knowledge. Totally. And it it's not. Yeah, it just it, it it's a shame because it's not necessary. Lack of knowledge, which leads to scared scared of talking to sellers and they don't answer their phone if they spend dollars on their marketing, which is crazy. You don't have to have a crazy big marketing budget too. A lot of our students will come in and work with us with somewhere between five hundred and a thousand dollars a month to start. Now we'd recommend you have at least that amount, but you don't necessarily need ten grand to go get started in this business. You need to have some money, but you don't need crazy amounts of money by any means. Again, and it depends on how hard you work too. Like again, it will take you much longer if you don't have any budget. Oh, 100%. But it can be done and you can bootstrap your way up. Again, you go to all your local meetups, your local RIA meetings, and you're talking, you're making friends with everybody. Eventually, you'll be able to co-wholesale or joint venture with another wholesaler who's been spending dollars. Uh, you're going to help them line up the buyer and the seller and make a little fee from that. So there's no reason... Um, not to. I mean, the lack of money people use as an excuse, the lack of experience people use as an excuse. Um, but yeah, there, there, there's really no reason that people. A hundred percent. Absolutely. Uh, they don't know how to find cash buyers. Oh, I skipped ahead. They don't know how to find cash buyers. That's simple. We can help you with that. Uh, they don't have a proven system that gets some results or a step-by-step -step process. I feel like we just did a great job of explaining this process, but we like to hold people's hands 
and walk them through this process when they work with us directly. Last but not least, they don't have money to hire a coach and they can't find affordable coaching. Well, guys, we have a plan to help you with that as well. Why would you need a mentor, right? Well, this is pretty straightforward. It's probably because you're struggling with any of these following things. You haven't got your first deal yet. You're creating, you don't have a step-by-step -step process to find and close deals. You don't know where to start developing a system that works. You don't have that or don't know where to start there. Uh, you lack experience and confidence. We see that every single day. Uh, not knowing where to start. I think we mentioned that twice already, but it's probably a good thing because that's a big point. Uh, you don't know where to find the deals or AKA how to market to the motivated sellers. Uh, you don't know how to evaluate a house. You don't know, you know, what you want to filter out those tire kickers. Those are the people that I mentioned earlier that want to sell versus those that need to sell. Uh, you don't know how to negotiate with the sellers. This is one of my favorite trainings that I like to do with, with students, Mike, is you know, teaching them how to run appointments mm -hmm. and, you know, how to make offers and how to talk to them and, you know, how to handle objections, all those type of things. Standing out in a saturated market, we already kind of addressed that. There's 80,000 people in St. Louis right now mm -hmm. that need our help. 80,000. All right. Um, and then, of course, determining repair estimates. All of these things could be reasons why you need a mentor. Guys, check this out. We have a program for you. All right. We'd love to work with you. We'd love to get you in our mentorship group. Here's what you get. You get lifetime access to our mastermind. We do three weekly coaching calls. We actually have one coming up in 15 minutes in our mastermind group. We do calls Monday nights, Wednesday and Friday afternoons. You get access to that group for life. We give you a customized action plan, access to all of the processes and systems that we use in our business to buy over 100 houses a year on a good year. Um, we have over 200 intentional and actionable videos inside of our mastermind community, and we're actively adding more trainings to that every single week. Uh, Mike and I own $13 million worth of real estate. It's actually probably closer to 14, maybe even 15 at this point, if you include some of your personal stuff and some yeah. of your personal stuff, you know, so we have about $15 million uh, worth of real estate that we own. We love buying rentals. We love fix and flipping. We love wholesaling. We do all of these things. We have calculators, contracts, leases, money raising tools. Um, in fact, Mike and I are going to be applying for a new tool this afternoon mm -hmm. um, that is going to help us raise probably around two to $250,000 worth of capital that we can use to buy and fix properties. And then of course, Discount Property Investors, the name of the group, right? Discount House Buying Tools. That's really the main thing here, guys. We teach you how to find off-market properties at deep discounts so you can have the tools to get in there and essentially craft offers that get accepted. All right. What is it all about? It's about the techniques and the trainings that we're going to provide you so you can start making offers, get them accepted, get some inventory on your hypothetical shelf so you have something to sell so you can get paid. And then last but not least, we have connections to hard money lenders and capital partners. And these are the individuals that we use in our own business to help you get started right away, all right? You can also learn how to make between two and $300,000 a year in your very first year, just flipping properties if you're not interested in being a landlord like Mike and I. Our passion is really being a landlord. And what we wanna do is we wanna help you put together that plan. We'd like to invite you into our group. We have a ton of testimonials um, that we can share with you all as well. We put together a short video and I invite you to come take this training. So I'm going to post this link in the group. Guys, check it out. Click the link, uh, watch the video, go ahead and apply. We would love to work with you. And with that being said, we can't wait to work with you. Check Thanks, it guys. out, apply. We'll talk to you soon. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.